Coming now to bring the word of God. From the heart of God is the senior pastor of Deliverance Evangelistic Church, Reverend Glenn Spaulding. Let's lift our hands and praise Jesus as the pastor comes. He's coming. Lift your hands and praise him if you love him today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Open that mouth and bless his name. Oh, hallelujah. Open that mouth and worship him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, our souls magnify. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it. Open it, open it, open it. Open it and praise him. Open it and thank him. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Tell him that you love him. Tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him. Tell him he's been good to you. And you thank him and you love him with all your heart. Ah, God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Oh, we praise you, we worship you, we adore you. Glory be to your holy name. We lift and exalt you above every name. Your name, your name is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, we do lift you, we do exalt you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for allowing our golden moments to roll on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, God, we lift the sick and the afflicted today. Those in hospitals and nursing homes, those in homes today not able to venture out for one disease or another, one sickness or another, or one condition or another, but we give them all to you today, even those that are listening by live stream here in the city, out of the city, on the other side of the ocean, wherever they are, oh God, we lift them before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Move by your spirit and touch and revive. Lift in the mighty name of the Lord, we do ask it. Thank you for your favor upon each and every one of us. You've been good to us, and we love you today. Thank you, oh God, that even while many have been wiped out of homes from fires and floods, thank you for a roof over our head. Thank you for clothes on our back. Thank you for a reasonable portion of health and strength. Oh, we honor you and we love you today. We don't know what the new year holds, but we know that you hold tomorrow. And we thank you that we're in your hands, that we're covered by the blood of Jesus. And the blood still works. And we thank you for it today. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise for it. Now have your way in this house. Have your way in our lives touch and revive and strengthen in the mighty name of the Lord. And we'll give you praise, we'll give you glory, we'll give you honor for it. Now lift those hands and open those mouths and thank him today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just a little bit more up here if you will. Come on, open that mouth and thank him. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Touch two or three people and tell them, look what God has done. Ah, 
look over at somebody else and tell him, and I'm yet alive to praise him. <laughs> oh, glory be to God. God bless you. You may be seated in his presence today. Oh, hallelujah. If you have your Bibles with you, come and let's go back to the book of St. Luke, the second chapter. St. Luke, the second chapter. We left off last time with the Christmas story. And now that the Christmas story is over, we're going to see the coming of redemption and the cost the coming of uh, redemption and uh, the cost. When Joseph and Mary took the baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, they met two faithful servants of God. The first was a man named Simeon, and exactly who Simeon was is not known. Some think he was a priest, but scripture does not say. All we know is what is recorded here. And he was a man of great faith in God and in the word of God, so strong that God was able to use him in a most magnificent way. And he used Simeon to proclaim one of the greatest messages of all time. And the events and the fate of the child Messiah's life. After the world has left off with the angels singing glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And the world went on and had Christmas and gave out gifts. Uh, now, let's see here what happens. Uh, from Luke, the second chapter. Let's begin there at the 21st verse. 21, 22, and 23. We want to work down until about the 38th. I'm not going to do the whole chapter. But there's enough in this for us to see the price that he's going to have to pay. Verse 21, and when eight days were completed, for the circumcision of the child. His name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, was completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Let's stop there. So we see that the child was named by his father, by Almighty God himself. Before he was ever conceived in Mary's womb, God had directed that he was 
to be named Jesus. And the name Jesus means Savior, or he will save. The Hebrew form of the name is Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. And in every aspect of his life, Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. His parents were careful to observe every requirement of the law pertaining to his birth. And the law called for every Jewish baby boy to be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Joseph and Mary fulfilled their requirements for the Son of God. And the Jews were proud to be God's covenant people, and they scornfully called the Gentiles the uncircumcision. And it's unfortunate that circumcision became an empty ritual for many Jews because it proclaimed an important spiritual truth. And his circumcision was his first suffering for us. The late Donald Barnhouse, a Philadelphia minister and author had said that, and it symbolized the work of the Savior that he did on the cross in dealing with our sin nature. But circumcision was only the beginning. When the child was 40 days old, Mary and Joseph had to come to the temple for the purification rites described in the 12th chapter of Leviticus. They also had to redeem the boy since he was Mary's firstborn child. They had to pay five shekels to redeem the Redeemer who would one day redeem us with his precious blood. Their humble sacrifice would suggest that they were too poor to bring a lamb, but oh my God, he was the lamb. After the birth of a boy, a woman was considered unclean for 40 days. It was 80 days for a girl. She could work around the house and engage in normal activities, but she could not take part in religious ceremonies. She was considered to be religiously, that is, ceremonially clean, unclean. And after a woman's 40 or 80 days were up, she was to make an offering in the temple. And Mary observed this ceremony of purification. God's law required that firstborn male children be consecrated to him. A male child was presented or dedicated in the temple and when the family had lived close to Jerusalem and accordingly Joseph and Mary dedicated baby Jesus to the Lord. Why would Jesus, the Son of God, be subjected to the legal observances of the law. He was not a stranger to the covenants of God, circumcision. He had created the covenants himself. He was not lacking in commitment, the dedication service. He was God himself, the one to whom all babies were dedicated, yet he was subjected to all the legal requirements. So Luke reports a significant detail. Mary offered two pigeons to the Lord as the sacrifice for her purification. This was the offering of the poor, a pair of birds. When women went to observe the rites of purification after childbirth, they were supposed to bring a lamb to sacrifice. But Leviticus 12 tells us that if they couldn't afford a lamb, they were allowed to bring two doves or pigeons instead. And the fact that Mary and Joseph brought birds instead of a lamb reveals their poverty. And this verse also lets us know that the wise men hadn't gotten there yet 
with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And this detail reveals the fact that God deliberately chose a poor family to rear his only son in an ordinary home without luxuries. Aren't you glad he wasn't born in the lap of luxury? So no matter what we have to bear in life, Christ has already borne it. Even poverty. He knows the suffering we undergo. Therefore, he is able to strengthen and carry us through the suffering. Somebody ought to say hallelujah to Jesus. He knows what everyone goes through. The saints of God who are poor as well as those who have a little in this life. Our Lord's relationship to the law is an important part of his saving ministry. He was made under the law of God, and though he rejected man's religious traditions, he obeyed God perfectly. He bore the curse of the law for us, and set us free from bondage. Aren't you glad to be set free from bondage today? I said, aren't you glad to be set free from bondage today? Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. Uh, let's look there at the 25th verse now. 25 down to 32. And behold... There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your, dis, your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. Somebody say, thank God for his word. So Simeon and Anna, get to Anna in a little bit, like Zacharias and Elizabeth, were part of the faithful Jewish remnant that eagerly looked for their Messiah. Simeon is usually pictured as a very old man, and we are given no information about his age, although most people assume he too was up in years as Anna was. A Jewish tradition says he was 113 years old. His request where he said, now dismiss your servant in peace, is hardly what a younger man would pray. So we get the impression that Simeon was patiently waiting for the hour to arrive when he would go to be with the Lord, and that attitude suggests that he was an older believer. He was a layman, not a priest, but his prayer to the Lord saying, now dismiss, sounds like the words of a very godly elderly saint. God's timing is always perfect. Anna came up just as Simeon was praising the Lord for the child Jesus, so she joined him 
in the song. Simeon then turned to Mary and Joseph with a word of prophecy. Simeon and Anna are examples of how you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. And the saints of God, as we grow older, there just ought to be an unction and an anointing upon us as we grow older, that we grow in the grace and in the love of our God and not in meanness. It ought to be a sweet anointing about our spirit. For Simeon had the Holy Spirit, 25 tells us, had the Holy Spirit upon him. And he was told by the Spirit that he would live to see the promised Messiah in verse 26. Uh, the Spirit guided him to meet the Messiah in the temple in verse 27. And Anna was a prophetess in verse 36, which means the Spirit was present and at work in her life. Led by the Spirit, she too arrived in the temple at just the right time and place to see Jesus. Then the Spirit enabled her to witness to others that the Messiah had arrived. So whatever their ages, Simeon and Anna were examples to all of us, but especially to older saints. Because these two believers were, as the word of God says, flourishing in the courts of our God and bearing fruit in their old days. That's what Psalm 92 tells us. So meditate in that Psalm 92, verse 13 this week. If we follow their example, we can have the same happy experience no matter what age we might be somebody ought to say thank God for being in his presence a, a long time oh hallelujah to Jesus uh, because the tendency of older people is to live in the past tense oh we love to live in the past tense in the so-called good old days and there was a book entitled the good old days weren't that good. And as the author writes about medical matters and the condition of roads and caring for the needy and communication, he proves his point. Some things were just awful. Somebody ought to say, thank God we don't have to go to no outhouse. <laughs> I said some things were just awful. True, there may be some things about the past that we miss, but there was more things that we don't miss. Amen. And we can certainly learn from history and seek to imitate the, past, the best of the past, but it's obvious that we can't live in the past. So we find Simeon and Anna, when they met Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus in the temple, their meeting was no accident. It was an appointment. Mary and Joseph were obeying God's word, and God was guiding them. Simeon is described as righteous, which means that he was considered a man full of God-honoring actions. He is called devout. He was careful about his religious observances. He was a faithful temple goer. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. It took the prophets, he took the prophets at their word and was looking for the coming of the Messiah. And it says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was a man deeply influenced and controlled by the Spirit of God. The consolation of Israel. What does that mean? It means the Messianic hope. One of the traditional Jewish prayers is, may I see the consolation of Israel. That prayer was answered for Simeon when he saw Jesus Christ coming in the temple as a babe. He was a man who was led by the Spirit of God, taught by the word of God, obedient to the will of God, and therefore he was privileged to see the salvation 
of Almighty God. How important it is for people to see God's salvation. They don't need to see us. They need to see the salvation of Almighty God, that we lift his name, that we glorify him, that we exalt him, and the anointing of his salvation will rest upon the people. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. So Luke 2, 29 to 32 says we find Simeon's response to seeing Jesus. This is the fifth, and it's the last of the Christmas songs in Luke. You remember Luke, Elizabeth had one in the first chapter from verses 42 to 45 that we went through. Mary had her Christmas song in the first chapter from 46 to 55. Zacharias had his song when he was able to speak again from verses 68 to 69. And then the angels lit up heaven from verses 13 to 14. It is first of all a worship him as he blesses God for keeping his promises and sending the Messiah. He joyfully praises God that he has been privileged to see the Lord's Christ, but his song is also a salvation hymn, for he says, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation in verse 30. Now he's ready to die. The word depart in the Greek has several meanings, and each of them tells us something about the death of a Christian. It means to release a prisoner to untie a ship, to set sail, or to take down a tent, and to unyoke a beast of burden. God's people are not afraid of death because it only frees us, oh hallelujah, from the burdens of this life and leads us into the blessings of the next life. And Simeon's song was a missionary hymn, which is something unusual for a devout Jew standing in the temple. He sees this great salvation going out to the Gentiles. Jesus has restored the glory to Israel and brought the light to the Gentiles so that all people can be saved. Oh, hallelujah. And remember that the compassion of Christ is for the whole world is one of Luke's major themes. So Simeon's prayer captures the glory of the gospel. The glory of the gospel from 29 to 32. The gospel brings hope. He begins with praise to God with an expression of ultimate satisfaction in God. And it is tied to the word peace. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. I, I done seen the Savior and I'm ready to get out of here. I'm old now and I'm tired and I'm ready to go on home to glory. Simeon is ready to die. He's at peace because he has seen the future hope of Israel and the world. And then the gospel is rooted in God's faithfulness. The peace that Simeon is talking about is linked to two phases. According to your word, for mine eyes have seen your salvation. Peace is not linked to an absence of conflict or pain, but to the assurance that God Almighty keeps his word. Has he kept his word when you were in the storm and in the trials and in the rough times of life, but he caused his word to rise up in you so that you could be here to praise his name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So he's at peace. And his heart is filled with hope because he knows that God has fulfilled his promise. And then the gospel is global. But the glory is not limited here to Simeon's experience alone. Central to the glory of what Simeon sees is the breath of what 
all of this means that you have prepared in the presence of my all peoples. God is being gracious to Israel, but Simeon knows that God's grace is going to overflow the borders of this small nation. And then the gospel is glorious news. Simeon knows that God's target is not just Israel, but all people. He expresses this so well in verse 22, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The small child that Simeon holds will be a light to the Gentiles and he will bring the revelation to non-Jewish people in order to bring Jews and Gentiles to God. All right, let's go to verse 33. And it gets a little rough right here. Verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel and of the tribe of Asher. She was not, she was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. All right. Simeon stopped praising and started prophesying. There is yet a third thing that Simeon says, as we've heard in this story. Here is the third and the final thing Simeon says about Jesus. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, the child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul also. Oh, my God. He will cause many to fall. He will cause many to rise. And many will speak against him. And in speaking against him, the hidden thoughts of their heart will be revealed. What a thing to say about a tiny baby. Mary, I know you're happy now. But you will weep later. Today your heart is filled with joy, but later it will be filled with sorrow. Oh my God, the world done left us now. world left us when the angels were shouting through heaven and, and singing glory to God, but they left us now. Now we're left to walk with Jesus. Oh my God, later it will be filled with sorrow. Rejoice and enjoy this time is what he was saying. Because dark days are coming. Isn't it true that if you're a parent, 
one of the worst things that can happen to you is to see your children suffer. Most of us will do anything to spare our children needless pain. We'll gladly suffer ourselves if it will make the way easier for our children. That's what it means to be a mom and a dad. You take the pain yourself so your children won't have to. But Simeon is saying, Mary, they're going to touch this child. Mm. And you won't be able to do anything about it. They're going to hate him, and they're going to lie about him. They'll spread rumors about you and Joseph, and they will smear his name with malicious lies. And you will have to stand by helplessly and watch it happen. Down the road, you know it all came true. They snickered and said, he thinks he's the son of God, but he's just filled with demons. In the end, hatred took full control, and they arrested Jesus and put him on trial as a seditious blasphemer. They beat him within an inch of his life, leaving his skin in tattered ribbons. And after the trial, he was condemned to die. In the end, Mary stood by the cross and watched her son die an agonizing, brutal, bloody, inhuman death. Amid the stench and the gore of crucifixion, Mary stood by her son, unable to stop the flow of blood, unable to wipe his brow, unable to hold his hand. It all happened exactly. Simeon wasn't a prophet, but he came in with a prophecy. Oh, my God, and he predicted when Mary watched her son die, that sword will pierce your soul. That's what he's telling him. My God, can you imagine standing blessing your child, and here comes somebody with a prophecy after the heavens had just opened, and everybody's shouting glory to God in the highest. Here you got to stand for dedication of your baby in the temple, and hear the prophet say, a sword is going to pierce your soul. Above that cradle is hanging the cross. This little baby was born to die. But God saw to it that, that they were strengthened through the experience. Somebody throw up your hands and say, he's a strengthener. Oh, throw up your hands and declare, I don't care what you got to go through, but God will strengthen you. So in his message, he used three important images. He said the stone, the sign, and the sword. Folks like to hear prophecy, but all they want to hear in prophecy is about a new house they're going to get. Folks love to hear prophecy, but they want to hear about how much money is coming in their hands. Folks love to hear prophecy, but they want to hear about all the good they're going to have. Nobody wants to hear prophecy where you got to walk by yourself. Nobody wants to hear a prophecy where you've got to stand the test when folks are getting ready to lie on you and talk about you and ridicule you and put you down. But God will give you strength to stand it in the midst. Oh, hallelujah. Let me walk here a little bit. The stone, the stone. It's an important Old Testament image of God. The Messiah would be a rejected cornerstone. And the nation of Israel would stumble over him. Because of Jesus Christ, many in Israel would fall in conviction and then rise in salvation. Even today, God's people Israel stumble over the cross. 
and do not understand that Jesus is their rock. But the way people speak about Jesus Christ is evidence of what the word says of what is in their heart. He is not only the salvation stone and the judgment stone, but he is also the touchstone that exposes what people are really like. Matthew says, what think ye of Christ is still the most important question for anybody to answer. This child was to be what the scriptures called the stone of stumbling. And the chief cornerstone, many would stumble and fall over him. They would not notice. They would not look. They would not choose. They would not believe or trust him and the salvation that he was bringing. And at the same time, many would rise because of him. That is, they would take notice. They would choose. They would believe him and the salvation. He was bringing to salvation to the people therefore he would become their foundation cornerstone anybody on a foundation today oh hallelujah and they would rise and be built up on him Jesus Christ causes every person to make a choice a person either rejects the Messiah God's salvation and falls eternally or accepts him and rises eternally did you notice how Simeon put it because of Jesus the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed with Jesus there is no neutrality no one can ever come face to face with the son of the living God and remain the same. Every time you see Jesus, you will either be drawn closer to him or you will move a little further away. That's what Simeon means when he says that Jesus will cause the rising of many and the falling of many. You either go higher spiritually when you meet Jesus or you turn around and go in the opposite direction. Then number two, the sign. The sign means a miracle. Not so much as a demonstration of power, but as a revelation of divine truth. Our Lord's miracles in John's gospel, they're called signs because they reveal special truths about him. Jesus Christ is God's miracle, and yet instead of admiring him, the people attack him and spoke against him his birth was a miracle yet they slandered it they said his miracles were done in the power of Satan and that his character was questionable they slandered his death and lied about his resurrection and today people are even speaking against his coming again but oh I love what we had talked about in Acts when Jesus was getting ready to leave out of here and stepped on that cloud and over 500 watched him with their mouths open, watched him float on into eternity. But an angel sat on the rock and said, why stand ye here gazing? This same Jesus, this same Jesus is coming back in like manner. Turn around and tell somebody he's coming back. Just like he left. Hey, glory to God. Hey, glory to God. Don't care what the world says, he's coming back. You can mock him, you can put him down, but when he comes, every eye shall see him. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Somebody throw up your hands and shout hallelujah. Oh, my God, let me finish here. 
And then number three, the image of the sword was for Mary alone. And it spoke of the suffering and the sorrow she would bear as the mother of the Messiah. Simeon warned Mary of the intense grief she would feel seeing her son, the only begotten son of God, rejected, killed by unbelieving people. And the sorrow she was to experience at the cross would be unbearably sharp and excruciating, just like a sword piercing her soul. And although God's spirit moved Simeon to proclaim this prophecy, imagine how painful it was for Simeon to do this. This child was the sign that would be opposed or spoken against. This statement speaks of Christ's death. He was to be opposed and eventually killed. So during our Lord's life and ministry, Mary did experience more and more sorrow until one day she stood by his cross and saw him suffer and die. However, without minimizing her devotion, Mary's personal pain must not in any way be made a part of Christ's redemptive work. Only he and he alone could die for the sins of the world. Oh, I know folks love Mary, but love Mary, but don't put her on a pedestal. Lift up Jesus and thank him for the price that he paid. How much did Mary and Joseph understand of God's great plan for this miracle child? We don't know, but we do know that Mary stored up all these things and pondered them. And the word means to put things together. Mary sought for some pattern that would help her understand God's will. There were times when Mary misunderstood him, and this would add to her suffering. But the last time Mary was named in Scripture, she was in the upper room hey, praying with the other believers on the day of Pentecost. So both Simeon and Anna devoted their waking hours to prayer and worship in the temple because they were waiting to meet the Lord's Christ. When Simeon saw him, he took the baby in his arms and sang that wonderful hymn of praise. When Anna the prophetess saw him, she gave thanks to God and went out and told her friends, the Messiah has come. How easy it would have been for these two aged saints to focus on their aches and their pains, their disappointment with the reign of cruel Herod the Great, or the grief over the worldliness of the priesthood and the decay of the temple ministry. Instead, they kept their eyes, oh hallelujah to Jesus, and hearts focused on the promised Messiah, and the Lord didn't disappoint them. Churches and pastors aren't perfect. They never were. Politics seem to grow worse by the day, and our bodies remind us that we're getting older, but God Almighty is still on the throne. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So as I close today, let me press the question home. What is Jesus to you? Not who is he, but what is he to you? Is he life or is he death? to you today. That's what Simeon is saying. This little baby who is the glory of Israel, who is the light of the world, who is also the great divider of the human race. You're either on one side or you're on the other. Oh, hallelujah. No one stays forever 
in the middle. The way you respond to Jesus reveals what's in your heart. Think about that. The way you respond to Jesus tells us who you are, what you are, and what is in your heart. But that's not all. The way you respond to Jesus tells us where you are going, how you're going, and how you're going to get there. And most of all, the way you respond to Jesus tells us where you're going to spend eternity. Jesus is the great divider of mankind. And was it not our Lord himself who said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Simeon saw it from the very beginning. First there was Herod and the wise men. One tried to kill him and the others worshiped him. Then later was Peter who repented and Judas who committed suicide. Then there was Pilate who, who tried to wash his hands and the centurion who said, surely this was the son of God. Then there was one thief who blasphemed and another believed from the beginning of his life to the very end. Jesus Jesus was the divider of the human race. When Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms, he said, Lord, I'm ready to get out of here. Lord, I done had enough of this mess. Mine eyes have seen my redemption. Mine eyes have seen my Savior. I'm ready to go on home and spend eternity with you. I can die in peace, but no one is ready to die until they have seen Jesus Christ with the eyes of faith. You're not ready to die until you have seen him and known him and trusted him as your savior. Is he your redeemer today? Is he your Lord? Is he your master? Do you walk with him on a daily basis? Do you talk with him on a daily basis? Has he saved you from sin? Has he washed you in his blood? Has he filled you with his spirit? Stand on your feet and praise him. Open that mouth and thank him. Thank him for the price he paid. Thank him for the price he paid for you. That you and I might be born again. Throw up your hands and glorify him. The decisions you make in this life will be the most important decisions of your life concerning who he is. What is he to you? He's got to be more than just a good man from history. He's got to be more than just a prophet who did great things. Is he your savior? Have you been washed in his blood? Have you been filled with his spirit? Do you have a personal relationship with God Almighty? The world left us left us exchange in presence. Many of them don't even know the rest of the story. That's why I got to teach the word. We got to know more than this. (laughs) 
We got to know more than falling out and speaking in tongues. We got to know who he is. And the price he paid for our salvation. Jesus Christ is the way. <laughs> I said he's the way. Not all these religions. Pastor used to say, religions come a dime a dozen. But the price he paid. I couldn't pay it. You couldn't pay it. God incarnate stepped out of glory in human flesh because he knew this world was without hope of a redeemer When Adam had sinned and Eve had sinned in the garden. I imagine it like this. That they all, before time and eternity. <laughs> that the three sat around a conference table. God Almighty. His son Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. God said to them, I need someone to go and pay the price for man's redemption. Jesus spoke up and said, I'll go, Father. He went, and then the Holy Ghost backed up and said, when it comes time, I'll meet you at the Jordan River to be baptized, and I'll rest on you like a dove. These three, where would you and I be? God the Father, God the Son. God, the Holy Spirit, paid a price for our sins that he didn't have to pay so that you and I could one day spend eternity with him and live as long as God lives. My God, you ought to thank him today. Thank him, thank him, thank him. So my message to you is, if you haven't received him, if you haven't accepted him, come on to this altar and receive him. Don't just be here because it's the first Sunday in the new year and you want to start out on a good foot? But come because you want a change in your life. Lord, I'm tired of the way I'm living. Tired of sin beating me down. You're looking older than your years. But he can restore what the canker worm and the caterpillar <laughs> has taken away and bring you life, bring you peace, bring you joy, bring you hope. Don't 
care where you've been, what you've done. The blood of Jesus. Oh, shatala the whole of the high. Is able to wash that sin away. So that we'll be able to one day stand before him. And hear him say, well done. <laughs> well done, thy good and faithful servant. You go home tonight and close those eyes and don't know whether you're going to wake up in glory or not. Do you know for doubt that you'll hear him say, well done? So the altar is open. Come on and get right with God. Sing it. Lift those hands and sing it. to this altar and open up your heart. Spirit of the Lord is dealing with you. Come on, come on to this altar. sing it. There's time, there's time. Come on to this altar. of drugs. You don't have to live a life of perversion. You don't have to live a life of ungodliness. Come on to this altar and get right with God. A New Year's resolution won't do it for you. You need forgiveness from Almighty God. Come on to this altar and receive Him.
deceive him. Drugs aren't the answer. Illicit sex is not the answer. Wickedness and unrighteousness is not the answer. Come and receive him. you'll finish out 2022 you better come on and get right with God he allowed you to step into this new year to receive him to confess him come on come on come on come on come on come on They're still coming. Sing it again. Lift those hands. Do you know him? Do you know him? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Get to this altar. You need to know beyond the shadow of a doubt when you walk out of this building, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. prevail over that heart the blood of Jesus prevail over that stony heart the blood of Jesus prevail lift your hands and say Jesus Christ is the way Lift those hands, say, Jesus Christ is the way. Lift those hands and say, Jesus Christ is the way. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Oh, hallelujah. These young people. Jesus Christ is the way. Hey, glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Let the people of God say amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. All of you standing here, look this way. Oh, hallelujah. This is the best decision of your life. The best decision of your life. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because all other decisions will be based how God will lead you and direct you, guide you and keep you. And if you stumble and fall, you say, Father. And that's who he is now. He is your heavenly Father. Father, forgive me. That word will be more precious to you the older you grow. So come on and say this prayer with me. Say, oh God, forgive me of my sins. 
and wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ. Save my soul and become Lord and Master of my life. Fill me with your spirit and I'll love you and worship you all the days of my life. Now say thank you for saving me, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me, wonderful Jesus. Touch this body. Let the power of God go through this body. Let the power of God go through this body. In the name of Jesus, every whit whole power of God, spirit of the living God, we thank you. We glorify you. We worship you. Yeah, let him release it. Let him release it. Give it to Jesus. Praise him. Hallelujah. Power of God. Power of God. Power of God. Power of God. Power of, God. Power of 